Okay, so we're gonna go through the AMCAS application. I just took a lot of screenshots and I'm gonna sort of walk you through and show you um, what it looks like. So I just want you guys to know the elements of the application and explain, I'm gonna explain how schools may potentially use the various fields and then it'll just give you a really good preview of what the application looks like so that um, you'll know what to, what to look for. So this is the main um, summary page. There's usually two summary pages that it starts with. Across the top, there's a header that always appears. So it has um, the school code, which is uh, the school that you designated your application to be sent to. So that appears when we download it as a school, we see us at the top and then our school code. It shows you what program you've applied to, whether it's a special program, an MD, PhD program, regular MD, MD, and PH. So that'll appear in the top corner. You can apply to different programs at different schools. So at UCR, you might be other special program. At another school, you might be MD, MPH. At another school, you might be MD, PhD. Schools don't have a way of seeing the types of programs you've applied to elsewhere. Um, so it always will show your legal name, your WMCID, um, page number, all that stuff. It will show your address and your phone number, all your contact information. Um, you can see here that it will show your legal residence and it shows the county and the state that you're in. So where you've claimed, this is, you can only claim one state as your legal residence through this um, address. Um, it gives uh, information on your visa status, your racial identification. Um, you have to indicate whether you ever have been convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor, uh, military service. There is a new field over the last couple of years that's um, a designated pronoun, which is really great. So you can put that in if you choose to. Um, we see whether you um, indicated yes or no to disadvantaged, whether you received a calculation for socioeconomic disadvantage. So this student um, did not because they didn't enter in full information um, about their parents because they're actually DACA. So it actually doesn't calculate um, this scale for them. If you received a fee assistance waiver, it shows that. Um, if you've previously matriculated. So what this means is, did you matriculate to another medical school in the past? So if you started at UCR and then you withdrew and then you're applying again through AMCAS, it would show here um, yes to previous matriculation. This is also a question where you um, enter whether you've previously applied. This only shows if you've previously applied to UCR or not. So it's a school specific flag. So if you one year applied to only UCR, and then the next year you applied to UCLA, UCSD, and UCR. The application that we download will show previous application in the year that you applied to us, but the other schools as downloaded will not show that you've previously applied. Um, you have to indicate whether you have an institutional action and whether there's a report on file for that. Um, and then you can also put in your uh, ethnicity, self-identification, uh, military service. It gives us a summary of the schools you've attended the dates you've attended, the majors and or minors that you've selected, and the degrees you've been awarded, and the number of hours at that institution, and then also goes on to include um, MCAT scores. Um, again, you can see uh, the, this one is regular MD. Instead, uh, it will show you the, the same kind of thing. This student actually went to two different schools. So again, the school summary will show um, major, minor, it shows a program level if you've gone to a community college or a junior college and the number of hours. So we see that this person did 93 hours at Riverside Community College and then 88 hours at UCR. Um, you can also put in more specifics into the race and ethnicity section. If you do include them, it shows up on this page. And this student did elect to, to show um, designated pronouns. The, I wanna talk about the report date, submission date, and process date. So these elements are, um, the report date is the date that the school pulled your application into their system. The submission date is the date that the applicant submitted their application to AMCAS and actually just paid their fee. The process date is the date that AMCAS completed verif verifying it and that it was ready for a school to download. So this student applied um, fairly late in the cycle and submitted on the 9th, but it only took a day for the AMCAS team to verify it and then the school downloaded it right away, we, we downloaded it right away. So you can see that those dates are not always the same um, depending on the, the, how long it takes AMCAS to verify. Sometimes submission date will say June and the process date is not until um, you know, sometime in July and then the report date might also be later on in July. 
And here's an example of the submission date. This student submitted on June 3rd. It was not verified by AMCAS until a couple of weeks later on June 17th. And then the school didn't pull it into the system until about a month later on July 17th. So when I talk about um, submitting, students are like, oh my gosh, I, I don't wanna be late. I don't wanna be late. Um, here's the thing, it's going to sit in the AMCAS system ready for the school to download until they pull it on the report date. So when we pull it into our system, everything is going to show the same report date um, unless we look at the original and see when you, when you submitted. So when we sort applications, we usually do it by report date. So everybody who submitted before J July 16th at this school is probably going to be pulled on the same day. Um, so you don't get like some huge advantage in, in submitting super early, only that you're sure that your application can be processed by AMCAS and be ready to download when the schools um, download in July. Okay, so again, you're, um, you're able to indicate um, visa status and citizenship here. You put your permanent contact information. Um, if you indicate the, your legal state of residence as something else, you, you can only claim one state. So if you live in Massachusetts and that's where you live, um, you don't have to put that here as your permanent contact information. You can put your home address in California and then on another page that I'll show you, you can list your, um, your current address and it can be somewhere else. So um, you can list more than one address. It's just this is the part where it would show the legal, the legal state of residence. Again, visa status can be US citizen, permanent resident, DACA. There are several different options um, that students can uh, indicate on the application. The racial and self-identification um, is two questions. So the, the MCAS application will ask you your race first, and it will it includes um, Black, White, Native American, Asian American, and then it will ask you, are you Hispanic, yes or no? So it's a two-question format. So there's um, one racial self-identification question and then an ethnic self-identification question. And you can put specific information in um, if you would like. So again, your different levels of, of race and ethnicity are allowed. And you can also write in uh, a description in this field. So there's drop downs, and then there's ones that you can specifically write in. So some students who have a specific tribal affiliation might want to write that in under the racial and ethnic um, racial discrimination. And then for the ethnic one, it would say no. If you only listed something under race, it would list under race. So these flags here for institutional action, investigation report, felony and misdemeanor, um, affect the routing of your application at almost every school. So if you say yes to institutional action or yes to an investigation report, um, or yes to felony or yes to misdemeanor, your application will likely go into a separate screening process where that will be looked at in some way, either before or after you submitted a secondary application. So if you have a yes of any of these, you can expect there to be some delays in the processing of your application. So maybe um, if you have an institutional action for your grades dropping below a certain level, or you have um, the investigation report is actually through AMCAS. So in the verification process of your application, if an investigation is open, there's lots of reasons. Um, Maybe students submitted a transcript that looked like it was a fake transcript, or maybe there's um, the, a bunch of their courses are listed wrong, or there's something, there's something out of the ordinary with how their file is verified. They will log a report about the investigation, and it will include all the documentation, and we'll log it so as schools, we can go in and view those reports. So it will let us know if there's an investigation report in the MPS verification process. So again, each of these elements can potentially impact how your file is routed at different schools. So it's important to know um, if you do have things in these areas and be prepared that it would potentially cause uh, delays. You do have an opportunity to explain, and I'll show you on the next um, several screens, explaining institutional actions, felonies and misdemeanors, you can put explanations in. So that's typically what schools are gonna look at as they make a decision um, about where your file goes next. The disadvantaged and socioeconomically disadvantaged um, applications and previous applications I think I talked about. So disadvantaged is just yes or no. And then if you indicate yes, you have an opportunity to list an explanation. The socioeconomic scale is for 
um, both your parents' occupation and your parents' educational level. So if you don't fill out the information, it will say unknown. If they're unable to calculate it, um, it will say not applicable, like if your parents have not gone to school in the United States, for example, um, or you listed educational levels where they weren't able to determine, um, or it will list E01 or E02, the two lowest levels of the um, economic opportunity scale that the WMC developed. So this um, SES disadvantage is derived from other fields that the applicant enters. You cannot elect to get the EO1 or the EO2 designation. It is drawn from what you enter about your parents' income and your parents' education. Um, again, it'll show us the schools you've attended. Um, you do indicate military service and if you've been honorably discharged and then it gives us a summary of your MCAT exam scores. Um, again, showing us the levels, the degrees that you've obtained. Uh, if you didn't obtain a degree, it will say um, no degree, but it will still list the hours and the total GPA um, of your time at that institution. Once we, um, this is one that's a much longer, uh, an example of, you'll see that there's an EO1 here, it'll say SES disadvantaged and an EO1, the student did not um, get a fee assistance. Um, again, the student attended several different schools, some of them say major, some of them, is, this is the one that they graduated from, shows the hours and then the GPA at each of the um, institutions that the student attended. So this is still in the main um, page one um, summary page for the applicant. And then the summary page um, concludes with the GPA grid. So it will show us um, the rest of your MCAT scores if you have them, um, your cumulative undergraduate, your postback undergraduate, and your graduate GPA. So those are the three GPAs that MCAS will assign for you in total. So on the summary page, we only see the cumulative GPAs across those three things. This student only has undergraduate hours and is a junior. So you can see that they have not yet completed their degree. Um, they only have 106. Um, here. And then this is where the AMCAS application also breaks out biology, chemistry, physics, and math, the science GPA, all other, everything that's left over after we take out the science GPA, and then the total. So you can see that the, the BCPM plus the AO equals the total. We also see in the summary sections the section scores and the percentile ranks for the MCAT. We see the test dates. Um, we see how many credits you've taken for pass-fail. So if you're wondering what this looks like on your AMCAS application, if you elect to take pass-fail courses because of the pandemic, it just shows up here under supplemental hours. How many credits did you take pass-fail and pass? This student passed 23. How many credits did you take pass-fail and fail? She did not fail any of those. But if you failed some, they would show up here. They do not get calculated into your GPA. They just get reported as number of credits failed. Um, AP credits also appear here. CLEP credits, if you have international baccalaureate, it might show up as other. Um, and again, the post-baccalaureate GPA, this student um, has six hours of post-baccalaureate coursework um, in, on top of the cumulative undergraduate. So it's listed as a very separate um, GPA to the regular undergraduate GPA. Um, each of the different um, sections of the MCAT are listed, as well as their respective percentages. We also see the confidence band of the score, which is the plausible range of the score that you received, and the total score is actually the center estimate. So the way that this score should be interpreted is we are 95% sure that this student scored between 496 and 500, and the center best estimate of their real score is 498. Um, so the confidence bands really do impact um, score interpretation because there's quite uh, usually a four points range of the confidence band. So um, again, on the, the, this is the first page of the actual application. So the summary is over. Now it gets into the long form of the application. So it will repeat more of the demographic and identifying information. Again, citizenship and where you live and your legal state. Um, it will show all the contact information. So this is where you can put your preferred address in. Say if you live in Massachusetts, but you want to put your permanent address in as California. Um, you can also put in um, different types of names and names that you've gone by. So if you have several different names that documents might be listed under, if you've undergone a name change, you can list these underneath um, the identifying information section. There is a place for you to include whether you have dependents or children. Um, and again, um, there's a little bit more specific information about military service, um, time of enrollment, separation date, and whether you're eligible for the GI Bill. 
Um, again, here's just a screenshot of um, what it looks like if you elect that you have dependents. We would know from reading this person's application that they have two children or two dependents. Um, it, it gets into language information, so you'll be able to list um, languages, your proficiency level, which is self-reported and not verified, um, and whether or not you, or to what extent you use that language in your childhood home. So again, here's a, another example of a racial self-identification. This person listed two categories there. It shows languages, so they have five languages listed. Here's the self-reported proficiency levels that they've listed for each of the languages that they are familiar with, and then what, when they've used them from in their childhood home. So some um, Hindi in their childhood home, mostly uh, Gujarati, and then some English, and then not really, they've acquired outside of the home American Sign Language and Spanish. So these are all, again, self-reported uh, areas that you can list for your skills. Um, if you list that you uh, want to put in your childhood information, you can. You can put in the setting, whether it's rural, suburban, or urban, um, the country and the city that you primarily have grown up in. You can um, put whether you think you've grown up in an underserved area for your childhood and your family income level. All of these things are self-reported um, in this section. So how many people are in your household, the number, if you've ever been on a family assistance program or public assistance program, if you've worked before the age of 18, if you worked and contributed to your family, um, if you received a Pell Grant as an undergraduate, and then if you, if you elect to describe how you've paid for post-secondary as your college education, um, it will give you a, a section to break out how you paid for that. The disadvantage explanation, if you indicate yes, you get 1,200 characters to describe how you're disadvantaged, and there's some criteria information there, so you'll be able to list those things um, as well. And then the parents and guardians information is what derives the, the SES disadvantaged um, flag for EO1 or EO2. So you list your parents, um, whether they're living or not, where they live, their education levels, schools they've gone to, and their occupation, uh, what they do for a living. So here's another example of a parent grid. This student said no to disadvantaged. Their education level of their parents is doctorate and masters, and then the schools they've, they've graduated from and what their current occupations are. So you'll see that it kind of gives you an opportunity to um, whether or not it pulls this information and lists them as SES disadvantaged, and whether or not they indicate that they're a first generation student. So then in the childhood information, again, you can put uh, suburban, urban, rural, the county and state uh, country that you've grown up in. This student elected to um, describe how they paid for their college education. It gives you a breakdown of academic scholarship, need-based scholarship, loans, um, student loans, which would be federal, other loans, which would be private, contributions from family, contributions from applicant and or other, if there's a special you know, grant program or some other uh, way that you've paid for school. So this gives committees a little bit of an insight into what your college journey has been um, from childhood and through undergraduate. Um, the parents and guardians information, if you don't have it, um, it will just say that you're not able to provide the information. It will not be able to give you the SES disadvantaged info because that's derived from parent information. This applicant does not um, have contact with their parents so they don't know if they're a first generation student and are not able to list any siblings. Um, this is the information about previous matriculation and previous application that I uh, mentioned. So in previous application, the student did apply to our school um, the year before. Um, they've not matriculated to any other medical school. If they did, it would show what medical school they previously had gone to, the year that they started, and why they're reapplying. Um, they don't have any institutional actions, but if they did, they would also get character limited space to describe the institutional action. Um, same with felonies, same with misdemeanor, um, and same with uh, military. So um, it, you do get a chance to put your explanation in at the same time that you have to disclose these things so that schools will be able to hopefully be very fair in how they um, look at those things. For SES disadvantaged, again, indicating first generation, you put in your siblings. This is the information that you can enter about your siblings, how old they are um, and their sex, and then it, it lets you um, just put that basic info. So you don't enter names or anything like that, but it gives us a sense of your, your household composition. Um, and again, the other previous matriculation information. So then it gets into your, your transcript and your record. So this is the information that students have to enter in on their own. So you essentially, from your transcript, type in all this information and then MCAS verifies it. So you list the school, 
Um, it gives you information on the year that you were a freshman when you took this course. This is the year that you took it. What quarter, semester, trimester did you take it? And then you put um, exactly as it appears on your transcript um, this information in. And then um, the, the original, OT stands for original transcript hours. Um, semester hours is what AMCAS converts them to. And then the original transcript grade and then um, whether AMCAS has made a correction. So if AMCAS makes corrections, they will list an X here. If they just mark it off as correct, it will list a slash. So if there's too many corrections being made in the verification process, it can trigger an investigation. If there's too many things listed inaccurately or incorrectly from your transcripts to the transcripts that they're verified once they receive your application on the other side. So um, let's go through a few more screenshots of this. So again, um, this student took some concurrent enrollment. So the status here is listed as high school. And you can see the year is 2005, 2006. Um, and then they started school um, a year after that. Um, this semester, um, semester one, semester two, whether or not you've elected the courses pass fail, you can see here that it does not include any semester hours into the, um, into the equation because they don't get calculated into your GPA. The original transcript grade is pass and the AMCAS grade is then pass. Um, so you'll, you can see sort of, they also flag courses that have been repeated. Again, they go in as um, full weight in the MCAS calculation um, GPA. Um, here you can see original transcript hours, semester hours, original transcript grade and AMCAS grade. Sometimes they don't change. They're, they exactly go straight across if the school is on semester systems um, or not. If the school is on, uh, is not on the, the same, um, court, it's on a quarter system, then the semester hours are going to change and be weighted very differently. So the original transcript hours for this course was five, but it gets weighted into AMCAS semester hours as 3.3. So the grade stays the same, but how it gets weighted into your GPA is different. So this is how you end up with a different AMCAS GPA than on your original transcript, because it accounts to convert everything to the equivalent weight in hours, so that those who are on quarters or trimesters um, are equalized across semester hours um, for all GPAs and all applicants. So if you did IB, it will show up on your application in this way, or AP. If you've done courses that are designated as honors, it will also show um, that, that those are um, indicated in the course type as well. Once you get to the bottom of your educational summary, we will find out what high school you went to, um, the city and county um, that it's located in and the country, um, what year you graduated from high school is also listed, and then your attendance uh, in college, as well as, again, the majors, the minors, um, the hours you've taken, and the total GPA at those institutions. We are able to then see the breakout, the full breakout of your science, non-science, and total GPAs by credit hours and performance. So again, the student took 16.2 semester hours um, in BCPM courses their freshman year, and their GPA in those classes was 2.62. We can see this upward trend for the students. So this is what we talk about when we say upward trends. This is what it looks like. It gives us your grades across each of these years including the post-baccalaureate, if you take any courses there, and then your cumulative um, GPA. The student doesn't have any graduate courses, but if they did, these would also be listed completely separately and not added into the undergraduate GPA. Um, you also see, again, pass-fail courses that are passed, pass-fail courses that are failed, AP credits, CLEP, and other, um, and other courses in the academic summary. So if you apply as a junior, you won't have anything in your senior year because you don't have those transcripts yet. You can totally apply with just the grades that you have and the committee will make a decision based on the information that they do have. So this student only has 101 hours. They probably have 20 hours to go, so a couple more semesters left. Um, and that's fine. So a lot of students who are applying and don't intend to take um, a growth year or a gap year, uh, it will just be application gets verified with the courses that you do have and sent to schools. When you um, get accepted and start medical school, you're expected to send your final transcripts to the school to verify that you have in fact completed your bachelor's degree, passed all your classes with whatever pre-med coursework, um, you know, passing grades are required for that school. So you're still accountable for finishing all these things. It's just not in your application to medical school. Um, we see the MCAT exams. So if you, if, say yes, you're gonna take the MCAT again. It will tell us when we can expect uh, a score. 
This is a field that you can actually go back and update. So if when you send the MCAS application to you in for verification, you plan on taking the test again, and you say yes, and you put your date here, and then you change your mind and you say, I'm not going to, you should go back in and update this because it likely will still be stamped on the application unless you go back in and update it. And many schools will hold your application if you've indicated a future date because they want to receive all information about your candidacy before they make a decision um, about the next phase. Every time you've ever taken the test and scored it, it will show the test date and all of your scoring information. Um, it will show scores before the new MCAT 2015 as well, if, if you in fact have any. So this is what I talk about when I say that you, you know, the MCAT scores are forever. They appear here regardless of whether you, you don't send them, they're connected because they're both owned by the AMC. So you'll have all this information for your scores here and then um, additional MCAT um, test date. Now this other test scores one is, should only be used if you're applying to a joint program and they are asking specifically for you to send other test scores. So maybe you're applying to a joint um, MBA, MD program and they want you to take the GMAT or the GRE. Then you should upload the scores here and put them here, but otherwise there's no reason to upload other test scores. Um, most people who are reading these that are just uh, a reading for medical school, don't know what the score ranges are, the interpretation ranges are for things like the GRE or the GMAT or the LSAT type thing. We, we wouldn't be able to interpret those scores or know if they're good or not. So they don't really help you to, to upload them. Get into your experiences section where you have 15 areas that you can put in. You indicate whether they are most meaningful on up to three of them. You, the experience type is a drop down menu that you choose. So there's, I believe, seven, I want to say 17 different types of experiences that you can choose from to categorize the experiences you've had. And then the rest of it, you fill in yourself. Um, all of the dates and the total hours, contact information, the title of this stuff, the, the emails of the people that you've worked with, and then you're allotted a certain amount of characters to describe the experience. So this is what it looks like on our end um, once you put those things in. If you say most meaningful, you get an initial space for the experience description and then most meaningful experiences were marked. So it's just a little bit of an additional essay that you get to write if you do that. Again, that's on up to three. Um, you can list your hours um, if you did it over a course of many years. You can put date ranges and total hours in for the same experience. You don't have to list the experience over and over. You can just list it once and then give us the date ranges and total hours for that. Um, and that's helpful in, in um, long-term experiences so that we can see each year the total number of hours that you contributed. The personal comments um, just appear uh, straight like this as an essay at the very end after the experiences section. Um, so just pay attention to the MCAS manual because if you use special characters or emojis or something in your essay when you submit it, they'll get turned into funky characters and sometimes the formatting will be strange, but it is very uh, very straightforward um, formatting for your personal comments. And then um, it will show the programs that you've applied to. Again, when you get your verified copy, it will list every single program you've applied to, the type of program that you elected. Remember we said you could do like uh, MD, PhD or MD, MPH kind of thing. It'll say whether you've previously applied to that school. The schools only receive um, their application. So this came to UCR, I'm only able to see UCR. Your verified copy that's sent to you will list all the schools that you've applied to. Um, so schools do not know where else you've applied. They only know that you've applied to them. You list your letter writers and whether or not, um, the, the it, here it tells us whether or not your letters have been received or not. If you list all your letter writers in here and they're planning on being sent in, but they're not received, this will say no. So some schools will not move your candidacy forward until all of your letters are received because letters can cause a lot of delays at the next phase. So depending on the school's process, you want to make sure that all of your letters are in. You can see here that if you don't capitalize Riverside, uh, it won't fix it for you. So there's no spell check or grammar checking kind of things um, in the application. So this is why you wanna make sure you go through it and correct all these little tiny errors. And that is the end of the um, AMCAS tour. So I'll, I'll stop sharing and we'll take some questions if you guys have questions. I did want to share with you my book and finally it has a cover design. So that's exciting. And if you're interested in checking it out, um, that's the information on my book. I can put it in the chat as well. All right, so questions. Let me, let me check the chat and see if there were any questions. No, okay.
any questions about the MCAS application and what it, what it looks like. I'm going to stop the recording now.